Minnesota Vikings training camp kicks off this week and we'll be there each day with great prizes up for grabs. Stop by, find our Mall of America Street team, enter for your chance to win those great prizes like KFN swag, Jordan Addison signed helmet, and don't forget about our Mall of America mystery cards. Get your tickets to training camp today, vikings.com slash training camp, vikings.com slash training camp. Is there a Jordan Addison signed something in the middle of that promo? Yes. Oh Jordan Addison signed helmet. Unfortunate, unfortunate timing there. Uh, Bradshaw and Brian K. Fan text line is 64686. A um, lot of interesting feedback regarding the question of trying to establish a non, a, a, an Olympic bed for the participants that might discourage extracurricular activity. Indiana guy in Duluth writes, I think the knock on these beds when they were originally were used in Beijing was that um, they couldn't support the weight of two people. I don't remember that being an issue. Maybe we can ask Lavelle. He was, wasn't he at the Beijing Olympics? Yeah, I think he See was. if he found out. What wow. if they just put the mattress on the floor? Comfortable his bed was. Well, what a couple people have said is, these are, you know, young people in pretty damn good shape. Do they even need a mattress? Yeah. I mean, do you even need to put a mattress on the floor? Do you need to put anything on the floor? Is that, I mean, people have been figuring out inventive ways to couple for a long time, they tell me. You think so, shot put guy can't I don't, carry some weight? Yeah, I don't, Come I just on. don't think, not sure that's going to be uh, quite that big of a deal. Uh, Dan, for those of us hillbillies, can you define amorous activity? Does that mean, does this mean screwing around? Ha ha. It might. What's the point of training your life away to become an Olympic athlete if you cannot bleep all kinds of in- international athletes? This is just stupid. In other words, what? Well, it'd be an interesting question on a survey. And maybe you'd get a more honest answer if it was anonymous. If it was, your name had to be on it, might not get the truth. What's the percentage of Olympic athletes who, when they do all the sacrifices that they must do in order to give themselves the best chance to be successful, have close to the top of the list the chance to mess around once I get to the Olympics? Because then there's the ongoing question of, and we've talked about it many times over the years, what kind of impact it has on your performance. There are some people who believe The more you perform, the better you perform in the Olympics. Others say, too much of a distraction. I'm off my A game. My routine has been affected. I can't go too far down this road. Or I'm going to waste perhaps the only opportunity I have to get a gold medal or get a silver medal or whatever the case may be. And you say, look. I'm with it. I'm wow. I'm young enough that even after the Olympics, I think I'm going to have a chance at amorous activity. So maybe I just hold it off a little bit and make the emphasis my Olympic performance, not my performance before and after my Olympic events, event or events. Um, then you hear that accent, though. Then well, it yeah, all goes exactly. out the door. Then, then you yeah. melt. Yeah, it's yeah. very possible. Uh, the story I read yesterday stated that the court, the cardboard beds and the discouraging of sex was from last Olympics due to the pandemic. That's from Jeff in Maplewood. The story stated that condoms with fancy logos and slogans are being distributed en, en masse in Paris. Yeah, I've seen those stories and the, um, the fancy logos, uh, not particularly subtle. And then there's the issue of... What do they call what among the nicknames for Gay Perry? What's one of the most famous? The City of Love. Now that's not the City of Lust, but it's close enough in a given moment. I mean, it's a place that that almost seems to drip with the concept of amorous activity of you know having a good time. Um. Uh, I mean, it can't all be about eating their those fresh baguettes they have in France, right? It can't just be about that as well. Um, you have world level athletes that are very amorous that want to go go to town, and 
you really think that cardboard frame is going to hold them up or somehow prevent them from getting to wherever they want to get? That's probably true. Um, <laughs> I can't. Well, here, this is an interesting theory. I had not heard this one. The backstory is these athletes train 90% of all their living days to get to the Olympics. And once they get there and they get to compete, they do other things as well because they've basically taken, up until then, a bottle of celibacy. Is that true? So is the rule of thumb that as you train to get the best, to extract the best out of what you have to, to give as an athlete, you must basically go celibate on the bit, and therefore once you get... But see, if you follow that logic, I would think you'd want to double down on that philosophy and say, I'm not going to ruin it now. If that was such an important part of me getting here, I would again say, start your column earlier, and then just after the Olympic competition, then, you know, go to town. Whatever you think you need to do uh, on the back end afterwards, that's up to you. Yeah, if your event... The pressure's off, right? If your event is in the first couple days, what do you have to lose? Anything the rest with of the week. modular in the name doesn't seem like something I'd want to uh, sleep in. Um, if 2024 Olympics are in the city of love, well, I don't know if I can even read this because I, it might be obscene and I don't know it. Oh, boy. So I'm not going to read it. It, it asks a question about say, um, Salt Lake City. But I'm afraid to read it because I might... I don't. I'm not always with it. And oh wild. yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't. That's not obscene. I I wouldn't read it. I'm not going to read it. I don't want to take a chance. Do you understand it? I no. I get it. Oh, okay. So <laughs> I then I it. then then you would confirm I shouldn't read it. I'm I, not going to. Then. I know people hate this, but I'll uh, I'll tell you in the break. I can't be the only one, writes Jake and Egan. But I'm pretty sure this is a, whole, a story every two years for the last two to three Olympics. Well, I I don't remember this story. I'll be honest. <laughs> I do remember stories about all you know the number of condoms and. What, you know, realistically you're going to expect and Olympic romances. I don't remember any concerted effort to um, construct the beds in a way that are supposed to be better made for sleeping than for uh, extracurricular activity. But what exactly do I know? Uh, don't forget, uh, no inbox today because Garzy's out. He's, he'll be back on the show tomorrow. Um, tomorrow's program, we've added Robert Smith. He's going to join... At 3.30, I'm assuming Ben Gessling will be back from training camp, and then uh, Lavel. In addition, later in this show, 5.30, uh, Gerald Posner's back. We just had him on a couple weeks ago to play off of an op-ed piece he wrote for the Wall Street Journal. Well, he's be he's popular. He just finished penning, and the New York Times finished publishing another op-ed piece. This one, I think, is a co-byline where he's the lead writer on another... Not unrelated subject to what we had him on last time, but still a different area related, quite rightly, I think, to the uh, post-assassination attempt investigation and the degree to which the approach the government has taken has tended once again, as it usually does, going all the way back to the JFK assassination in 1963, to arouse conspiratorial suspicion and that he was hoping that by now we might have learned our lesson in that regard, and he drills down on on that uh, particular subject. Uh, grand in your hand time now, right? It is. The fan of BigTech.com want to give you a shot to put a grand in your hand at the National Cash Contest. Head to KFAN.com and the keyword bills for this hour. Keyword bills. KFAN.com. Keyword bills. Are you a Chipotle guy? I'm not. I am a big Chipotle guy. Okay. There is a significant Chipotle controversy. Oh. You heard about this? No. <laughs> I mean, it's so significant that the Wall Street Journal wrote about it, among other uh, publications. That's going to be in the mix. I want to get back to the great border czar controversy as it pertains to uh, Kamala Harris, the vice president, now running for president, because I think there's more meat on that bone. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll cover a little bit. We got into it a little bit with Chris Carter, uh, the not all that uh, helpful Vikings injury news at a position, as he said, where they are already thin, already looking for some help as well. Stay tuned. Man.
Find our Mall of America Street Team all summer long out at our events. Ask about the Mall of America Mystery Cards where everyone is a winner. And see where we'll be next. KFAN.com keyword calendar. Well, I think it's um, stating the obvious, but still worth stating, that as consumed as I have been and many of the listeners, Vikings fans have been, about the quarterback saga, there are so many other variables that will factor into whether the Vikings can recover nicely in the 2024 season after, you know, the world closing in on them in the second half of the season after Cousins went down, obviously. And because we spend so much time on the sexy position, I don't say we forget about those other issues. We just don't maybe emphasize them enough. I don't know how long I feel like the Vikings have had challenges at the cornerback position. It feels like forever, that there have been significant issues, uh, swings and misses with high draft picks, uh, just the inability in a, in a league that is clearly more about the past, obviously, than it's ever been, to feel comfortable about what you're doing against them. Now, you know, Flores, I think, because of his approach, has made everything seem fresher and more interesting, but ultimately especially if you want to play a more aggressive defense, which I think he really does, you have to have cornerbacks who can cover, right? This isn't, again, going out on any limb, but it's important. And the news yesterday that broke regarding Makai Blackman, not good. I don't know what he was going to become this year. There was no guarantee that he was going to take the next step. He's a third-round pick out of USC a year ago. Now, he played in 15 games, started three. And he certainly was in the mix as perhaps somebody who could 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 play more often, could take the next step. He's no longer available. We know, as we laid out with Chris Carter, the tragic story regarding the rookie Kyrie Jackson. He was a fourth-round pick. Who knows how quickly he could have been a factor, but the Vikings did have, obviously, some hope for him. So uh, we, we picked up, um, was it Duke Shelley? We picked him up, I think, on Tuesday. We'd already picked him up. And then uh, double-check the name of the individual. I think it was just in the iHeart uh, update. Another corner that we just signed in the wake of the Blackman news is he got hurt, obviously, yesterday. Significant. Uh, the Francis? Injury. I, I I'll take your word for yeah. it. I don't remember. He's obviously uh, is he a, a journeyman? Is he? I don't I don't know much about him. Um. So you've got Shaq Griffin was a veteran corner that was signed because the, the, remember, um, maybe I mean we we know what Flores wanted to do. He wants to play more man to man. And that goes back to whether you can trust your your defensive backs, especially your corners, to to play the position. There's been talk about Murphy perhaps being used more in the slot. Griffin was uh, became a starter during spring practices. Is he worthy? Is he up to it? I don't know. He might be. Who's to say? Duke Shelley is experienced, been around, but. Journeyman's got he's got journeyman written all over him as well. So even before tragedy and then injury struck, I don't think there was any certainty about what the Vikings had at the corner position. And now it's fair to say that there's even greater question about whether you can, you know, sort of piece something together. And if you can't, then I think the sad part about it is if you like if you believe in aggressive defenses the chances that your coordinator will be comfortable doing that as often as you as you want to go down right it's just at some point you can you can't you can't knock your head against a wall and get burned too often so um not a good start for the vikings in that regard um and again i it, it's it's kind of remarkable when you think uh about the number of corners the vikings have have 
the capital the Vikings have expended at the position, it's hard to argue with the decision to the extent that it's important. It's it's clearly now one of the most important positions in football, right? I mean, you can't argue with that. But uh, our percentage is not uh, particularly good in that regard. So um, as much as we want to find out what's going to happen to quarterback, you heard Chris Carter say that he believes that by, what did he say, eight week, was it six or week eight? He said in that range, he expected by then J.J. McCarthy to be the starting quarterback for the club. He's not buying the notion that you're going to stick with bridge guy much longer than that. Um, that's going to be a storyline to follow. But in terms of the, the the Vikings recovery this year and wherever this thing's going to go, um, this is probably in some ways even more daunting because this isn't about one player. This is about an ensemble player of cornerbacks. You can never have enough of them. I know, you know, uh, we like to use a lot of safeties too. And and maybe the wheel can be reinvented by Brian Flores in that regard. He showed some of that last year. But I would just say, um, if you came into this camp concerned about the corner position, you wouldn't be wrong. But based on what's already taken place, I think you got to say it's even more alarming and more concerning about what you're going to be able to put together, regardless of what happens in the quarterback succession. Um, defense matters. Being able to defend the pass matters, and as Carter said, look at the quarterbacks in this division. In all seriousness, it looks like your guy, I read today that the uh, the Packers and Jordan Love are getting closer to an extension. Have you read that too? I, I've read it for the past couple months. Yeah, well, that still, still hasn't happened. Waiting. But yeah. I think it's going to. But bottom line is, he's shown that he's got a chance. Yeah. Uh, Goff, I've never been a big fan of him because of the fumbling issue or just giving up the ball issue. But he's starting to win me over. It feels like it might be the, the 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 classic example of you know right team meshing with the right quarterback, and he's matured a little bit. He's gotten smarter about it. He's got a lot of great talent around him. He can he can fling the ball, and Carter is in love with the Bears number one quarterback, Caleb Williams. He thinks he is special. Some people do. And the advantage they're giving him. We've talked about how any quarterback here has the advantage of some pretty nice um, offensive talent, skill players, right? Bears have put together a an outstanding array of receivers and running back, frankly, that makes you think that if Caleb struggles, it's not going to be because of his supporting cast so much as it's just you know growing pains into the position. But the point is... Potentially, in this division, and you could argue now, going forward for a while, you've got three legitimate passers. Goff is obviously older than the other two, but he's not ancient yet. So um, we cannot emphasize enough the importance of figuring this thing out at the cornerback position. And now, um, in day one, when you lose one of the options, that, uh, too, is not um, particularly Encouraging, And even if we get in training camp and we go starting next Monday, lost in the quarterback's eyes and that whole story, we should not lose uh, connection with important challenges at other positions, starting with, as I mentioned, the uh, cornerback spot. Um, an hour from now, as I mentioned, Gerald Posner will join. Top five at five will be coming up closer to uh, the top of the hour. I've got some uh, A-section stuff I want to get back to. In our upcoming segment regarding a, uh, a media controversy that is ensuing regarding the uh, the presidential race. And at some point, we're going to have to try to break down this, uh, this Chipotle controversy. Because, uh, by the way, let me correct. It wasn't, the story I read wasn't Wall Street Journal, but it was New York Times. New York Times, you could say even a bigger uh, newspaper as well. So all of that on the table. Brad on Brian K. Fan text line is open to you at 64686. Guardsy will be back tomorrow along with an outstanding array of guests, including Robert Smith, Lavelle, and uh, Ben Gessling. Stay tuned. <laughs>
If you want to chime in on what's happening with your favorite KFAN shows, you can make your voice heard on the Bradshaw Bryant KFAN text line. So let us know what you have to say by texting your message to 64686. That's 64686. Standard text message and day rate supply. Well, it's almost uncanny how these things work. Vikings practice today. Today. Shaq Griffin, who I just mentioned, goes down while returning an interception during 11-on-11, spent time, according to Kevin Seifert, with medical officials on the sideline. And Seifert has just updated that report five minutes ago with Griffin walked off the field after practice with medical officials. Now, that doesn't have to be ominous, but it's not helpful. Um, So, just what we were chatting about earlier, cornerback situation, already a bit concerning, would get clearly worse because Griffin was being used as a, potentially as a starter in some of the off-season drills. So, um, Seifert also notes following that, the Vikings cornerbacks in the nickel were Byron Murphy, Caleb Evans, and Duke Shelley, who just showed up a couple of days ago. So, um, pay attention to it, but none of that is encouraging at a tough spot. Emailer Paul, look at Vikings history at the position. Trey Waynes, pick 11, 2015, bust. Mackenzie Alexander, pick 54, 2016, bust. Mike Hughes, pick 30, 2018, bust. Jeff Gladney, pick 31, deceased. Cam Dantzler, pick 89, 2020, bust. Harrison Hand, 2020, bust. Blackman, season-ending injury. We know about the Kyrie Jackson tragedy. You really can't make this up. It feels like we are officially cursed. How is your team at the cornerback spot? Are you good? I'm a very big fan of Jair Alexander. Yeah, hard he's to argue with that. He's one of the best in the league. Yeah. So yeah. even though he's a, a, a character, I'll say. <laughs> With all that means, good and yes, bad, right? Yes, Um A section, which we'll be discussing at 5.30 as well with uh, Gerald Posner. Not this particular subject, though. The, the new debate and media battle is whether history is being rewritten and who is doing the rewriting as it pertains to the question of whether... Vice President Harris was or was not the border czar. The border czar. So I'm looking at a number of stories, this one including one from Axios, suggesting under this headline, Harris border confusion haunts her new campaign. And according to the Axios reporter, in early 2021, President Biden enlisted Vice President Kamala Harris to help with a slice of the migration issue. There is confusion around the VP's exact role and early media misfires and the rapidly changing regional migration crisis has made the issue a top target for the GOP to to try to define their new opponent. Story quotes former Department of Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson. She is not the borders are. Time Magazine, I just read this piece yesterday. Headline, Kamala Harris was never Biden's borders are. USA Today, something similar. CBS, the facts about Harris's role on immigration in the Biden administration. And it goes on from there. Borders are, by the way, isn't an official. That's part part of the issue on the fact checking. Is there's there's it's a it's a it's an imprecise. It's not an official term. It's one that has become very popular in terms of media shorthand, and it sounds cool to say whatever you know. NBA czar, border czar, um, economy czar. Sounds impressive. Sounds weighty. And sometimes it can just be used as shorthand. 
Now, I think there's a lot of disingenuousness about this story. Not surprising in 2024, I would say. Example. The same Axios reporter who is now saying there is confusion about the VP's exact role and that it's misleading to suggest that she was border czar. Wrote this March of 2021 under a headline that reads Biden puts Harris in charge of border crisis. Same reporter. That time, the reporter said the VP would be addressing the migrant surge at the U.S. Mexico border. And that Harris would lead efforts with Mexico in the Northern Triangle. That's Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador to manage the flow of unaccompanied children and migrant families arriving at the border in numbers not seen since a surge in 2019. White House official told reporters at the time, President Biden said during the transition, whatever the most urgent need, he would turn to the vice president. Today, he's turning to the vice president. New York Times, 2021. Ms. Harris will soon, also soon be taking over work from a departing official with years of experience. Last week, Roberta S. Jacobson, the former ambassador to Mexico, chosen as Mr. Biden's border czar, said that she would retire from government. She said she was happy to see Mrs. Harris assume the work of stemming migration from Central America. Washington Post, 2021, describes the vice president as taking on, quote, the lead role on the overall border and regional issue. Now, at the very least, I would suggest that if there has been an attempt to make Harris front and center the person to go after regarding the border, it might well be that media outlets, respected media outlets, need to look in the mirror and say, well, you might have contributed to some of that on the basis of the words you chose at the time. And now it sounds like you're trying maybe a little bit too hard to get in the way. Now, Axios, I think, has is, is acknowledged, well, maybe even we didn't do a very precise job. But let's, again, not be too silly here and to say, if you if major publications went as far as they did at the time, then that's going to give some ammunition and maybe even some legitimate ammunition to her role, whether you want to call it czar or not. Like most things, my guess, based on what I've read, is that the truth is somewhere in the middle. That clearly, ultimately, the president is responsible for the border or border policy. To that extent, the president is the border czar. And to ever assign too much baggage to the VP is a, 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 an ongoing political game that's been played for centuries in this it, it, between the two parties. Hell, we're all talking about 1968. Go back to 1968. It was LBJ who pursued the Vietnam policies that he pursued. Now, Hubert H. Humphrey may have agreed with many of those, but ultimately it was LBJ's decision. But when LBJ decided not to run, guess who was associated with those policies? Well, the guy who worked in his same administration was his running mate, was the vice president. And Humphrey then tried to do the del delicate balancing act for a while of being not being disrespectful to LBJ and not, I guess you could say, running from the notion that we needed to make some changes in our Vietnam policy. And by the way, towards the end, before that election cycle, he did try then to, to, to create some air, some distance between him and the president. But the point is, whatever policies, good or bad, we associate with an administration, it's not exactly new or politically one-sided for the party out of power to say, well, that's that's yours too. You are you're a VP. That's yours too. Yeah, hell yeah, you're part of the deal. Whether that is completely fair, I don't think it ever is completely fair because I do believe the VP role is so different. Yet, 
I think it's also disingenuous to suggest that even if the actual responsibilities that Kamala Harris had are more specific and a little bit more narrow than the general borders are, that doesn't mean she bears no responsibility if, by the way, that part of the policy is among the policies that failed. So we get instead into these games of, was she really a czar? They're throwing out the word czar a lot. Was she czar? Let's look it up. Probably not. (laughs) Even though major media outlets did use that term. Which is why people shouldn't be surprised if it's coming back, if it's, there's some blowback now. We're left with another one of those gray area situations where, again, it's not quite as sweeping as some Republicans want to believe, but nowhere near as limited as some Democrats. And now, quite frankly, I think some media outlets are suggesting as well who, again, have to go back and check their own material at the time. I've laid it out. These are Those are direct quotes. Uh, by the way, associated subject that it got my uh, attention, I thought was rather interesting, from a writer named Kevin Drum. Liberal and conservative myths about illegal immigration. He filed this, this is just three days ago. Myth. The first cat, first section is liberal myths. Myth. Crisis talk is just conservative scaremongering. Reality. Illegal immigration has skyrocketed under Joe Biden. Both Obama and Trump averaged 35, about 35,000 migrants per month. Biden has averaged nearly 200,000 per month. That's just factual. We've talked about that issue forever. It's not a good talking point for the Dems, for Biden or Harris as part of the administration, for anybody on the Democratic side. We quoted, I quoted Jay Johnson earlier who worked for Obama. He was among those who said, these numbers are not tenable. They, 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 they cannot be sustained. So that, I think, drums right, this is real. Myth. There is broad support for liberal immigration laws. Reality. This used to be true, but not anymore. In Gallup polls, support for increased immigration rose steadily for many years, reaching 34% in 2020. Since then, it has plummeted. Support for increased immigration is currently at 16% compared to 55% who want it decreased. 86% think illegal immigration is a serious problem. Support for building the wall has risen above 50%. How about a couple conservative myths? Myth one, we are currently in the middle of a migrant crime wave. Reality, there is no evidence for this. Crime has declined substantially over the past few years, and multiple studies have found that immigrants are less likely to commit crimes than native-borns. doesn't mean there aren't any, but that's a very different issue than whether, oh my God, it's been through the roof. Conservative myth number two. Central American countries are emptying their prisons and mental institutions and sending their inmates to the U.S. Reality, this is flatly made up. There is no evidence that this is happening. Myth three, illegal immigrants are taking jobs away from Americans who need them. Reality, the employment rate of native-borns remains near pre-pandemic highs. Generally speaking, illegal immigration rises when there are labor shortages in low-wage jobs that Americans do not want. These are typically jobs that require no English and can be paid under the table. Natives and and legal immigrants work almost exclusively in conventional jobs that require English skills. And lastly, myth, illegal immigrants don't pay taxes and will eventually bankrupt Social Security. Reality, illegal immigrants pay sales taxes, property taxes via rent, and even some income taxes and payroll taxes. However, They are not generally eligible to receive Social Security, so they make the program stronger, not weaker. Likewise, they are ineligible for most welfare benefits. They are eligible for schooling and emergency medical care, but the taxes they pay makes this roughly a wash. Overall, illegal immigration is a, quote, small net positive for the U.S. economy, which, again, according to this particular writer, doesn't mean there aren't legitimate concerns, and uh, there certainly are myths on Either side in that regard. Bratch on Brian KFN text line is open. It is 646 
eight six. That is the uh, text line to at which to reach us. Um, part of the, I think again the the challenge for anybody is trying to get past on any of these stories what becomes sort of the the angle the conclusion that's drawn and usually as i said what one finds is that it's not always the case but that the truth probably is somewhere in the middle now i'm not sure there's middle on this Other than this particular quote, which is now getting a second life, is a couple of years old. I think J.D. Vance said this. Um, it was in a, I think it was a, a was it a Fox interview or uh, who's the guy who used to be on Fox, who now is on uh, has his own. I mean, he's only he's created his own empire. He spent some time in Russia. I, I, the name will come to me in a minute. Um, I have a problem with names, as most of you know that is getting a second life because this is what happens when you are elevated you know when you're put on a presidential ticket and you've not been serving all that long jd vance hasn't been serving all that long uh the game becomes so oh, interesting comments that uh, might either come back to haunt them or help them depending on your point of view there's a story of that um this one just doesn't make any sense to me if he if he means it J.D. Vance says Americans without children should, quote, face the consequences and the reality, unquote, and not get, quote, nearly the same voice in democracy. Let's give votes to all children in this country, but let's give control over those votes to the parents of those children. Refers to uh, the childless, childless cat ladies of the country who allegedly have no stake in America. How does this pass for profundity? For aha moments? For wow. That's eloquent. That's food for thought. There's a lot of discussion and a lot of pushback on um, some of the things that uh, Vice President Harris has or hasn't said and the way she sometimes goes about communicating in sort of circular fashion where if you get to the end of it and you go now what was that again is there anything in there is there anything in that statement that really advances the discussion but at least she's been out there for a while jd vance i i gotta tell you i know the book the, the hillbill El elegy conceit was considered clever highly thought of but I, I I I don't get I completely and utterly don't get the attraction. I don't see what exactly he has to offer. And I know we hate the notion of lifetime politicians. And I'm not sitting here to say that everybody should be a lifetime politician, but he's been around for like it feels like eight minutes politically. What does that mean? Childless cat lady. Who decides? Who gets to decide? Who, you know, should be representative of whatever we are. The notion that it's simply about whether you have children or not is how you decide how invested you are. Stupid. Doesn't even, it's, it, it, it's not, doesn't strike me as, huh, I hadn't really thought of it that way. The question I think is going to be, um, and we'll, I guess we're not going to know the answer to this to the election day. Um, does he help the ticket or hurt the ticket? Or is this a classic case of the way we always think of VP candidates? That ultimately the rule of thumb is you, you bring someone in who doesn't hurt you. That rarely do we have many examples of vice presidents who made the difference or are believed to have made the difference in in bringing the presidential running mate over the finish line but that what you can do occasionally is hurt 
the chances for the presidential candidate hitting the finish line first because of whatever, uh, stupid comments like this or something else in the past. I, I So I don't know where uh, exactly he's going to uh, factor in there. But that, 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 again, and you could say, well, that's two years ago. That's a little bit unfair. Everything becomes fair game when you are elevated to that position, and that includes both sides of the aisle, I would say. Both of them. Uh, Stephen Maple Grove, whether Harris was tapped to be the border czar or not, the VP is there to carry out the president's policies. She was acting at, pre- at Biden's direction for better or worse. Well, I would say to Steve, so is your conclusion then she becomes criticizable, or does that take away the ability to criticize her because her position, no matter what her own position is, it must be she is serving the President of the United States to that extent. That would be my follow-up, because I think it's a fair observation, but I'm trying to figure out, you know, sort of what we do with that. I'll say again, even if she wasn't the borders are in whatever grand at whatever grand level you want to you want to factor in that description, she did have some responsibilities. I think that's a better way to put it that it wasn't just her. And I always believe, as I said, it's more about the the, the president, the VP. But if we get too hung up on the czar part of it, we're not telling or following the whole story, which is she did have some specific responsibilities. And let's see if I can find the uh, the quote. Did I save the print? No, I didn't. I think I've got it online here, though. The uh, <sighs> Here's the quote. In her first foreign trip as VP in June 2021, Harris was tasked with delivering a blunt message in Guatemala City. Quote, I want to be clear to folks in this region who are thinking about making that dangerous trek to the United States-Mexico border. Do not come, she said at a press conference, pausing for effect. Do not come. And at the time, I think she got some criticism on that from people on the left in her party about what kind of message, unwelcoming message that was. I'm not sure I was as offended by it. But the fact is, if all we're arguing about is whether she's a border czar or not, I'm not sure we're all that interested in trying to get to the accurate place, which represents she did have at least a piece of it. And we should be able, when we do the job of laying this out, factoring that in and not making it an all or nothing sort of proposition. And I'll say again, when media outlets at the time actually described, presumably in good faith, her role as being bigger than that, there should be a little less surprise that folks are going to notice, just like people are going to notice, even though it was two years ago, what the vice presidential candidate on the Republican side had to say when it came to whether people who don't have children should have anything to do with any sort of policy decisions at a major level in this country. It's not, doesn't have to be all wins and losses. It should be well, if we follow the story, what's fair to say about Harris's role? Not all of it was her. That's too grand. That's too general and probably inaccurate. But it was more than just trivial on the basis of even what the president said he wanted to get out of her. There were role. There was a significant role that she had. And then I guess you decide whether how much you want to then associate her, blame her for the policies, which I I say again, I don't think ever never makes sense, but is hardly unprecedented when it comes to vice presidents being linked to whatever the presidential policies might be. Let's stop pretending that there's anything particularly unusual or outlandish about that. Top five. I will get back to the toy department and have more readings from Vikings training camp tweets.